Isaiah 53 is a powerful chapter spoken about 750 years in advance detailing what Jesus Christ would accomplish on the cross. Here is a verse by verse look at this amazing chapter. All right, if you have your Bibles please, um let's turn to the book of Isaiah. We're going to spend some time here in Isaiah chapter 52 and uh, chapter 53. there is so much you can preach about the cross it's 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 the most it's the greatest thing uh to preach about the cross the message of the cross and you can come uh to talk about the cross from various angles but today i want us to just spend time here in these verses that begin from isaiah 52 verse 13 to the end of isaiah 53 and just spend time here looking at these words from the book of isaiah so let's read through it first and then we will spend time together on these verses so i'm going to read from isaiah chapter 52 verse 13 onwards through to the end of chapter 53 verse 13 of isaiah 52 behold my servant shall deal prudently he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high just as many were astonished at you so his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men so he shall sprinkle many nations kings shall shut their mouths at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider Chapter 53 verse 1 Who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground He has no form or comeliness and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten by god and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities The chastisement for our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth he was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation for he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people he was stricken and they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death because he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth yet it pleased the lord to bruise him he has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the lord shall prosper in his hand he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore i will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors the 
just a little, little bit of background to the book of Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah prophesied somewhere around, and this is approximate as you know, somewhere around seven, seven, about 750 BC approximately. It was around that time. His ministry extended through four kings. And uh, he probably ministered for a, a period of 50 years. Now, the book of Isaiah is quite amazing, quite an amazing book. It has 66 chapters, just like there are 66 books in the Bible. 37, the first 37 chapters deal with history, deal with judgment. The next 29 chapters deal with God's comfort, God's salvation, and future glory. Divided just like that, almost like the whole Bible is divided. So it's many call it a mini Bible, the book of Isaiah. And just, just to, this is a side note for us to understand how reliable, how accurate what we are reading, how accurate it is, how authentic the scriptures are. You know, when we talk about scriptures, we look at two things when we want to talk about the authent authenticity and the accuracy of any manuscript or scripture or any writing that we find from old times. So when we talk about the book of Isaiah and the, and, the, and the scriptures in its entirety, here are some facts for us to understand. You know, up until about 1947, the oldest copy of the Old Testament was about 900 A.D. So the Old Testament was completed in 400 B.C. And the oldest copy that we had of the Old Testament scriptures was around 900 AD. So that's how many years gap? 1,300 years gap. You're with me? Just a side note. We'll come to the main message. <laughs> right. So there was a 1,300 gap. So we call, it, call this as a time gap in manuscripts. That means from the time the original was written to the oldest, uh, the oldest copy that's available of the manuscript. What's the time gap? Because the closer you are to the original, the more accurate you're likely to be. So up until 1947, there was a time gap of 1,300 years before the close of the Old Testament to the oldest copy of the manuscript that we had. But in 1947, something amazing happened. A shepherd boy was walking to the caves along the Red Sea and he stumbled into the caves and he, find, he found lots and lots of pots earthen pots and so of course this was an archaeological discovery so what they did was they found in 1947 in the Qumran caves on the edge of the Dead, Dead Sea they found copies of the entire entirety of the Old Testament except the book of Esther all of the Old Testament copies were there on leather parchments and these dated back to 200 BC that means now the time gap reduced drastically to just 200 years. You with me? Okay. But here's the amazing thing. They had a copy of the book of Isaiah from 900 AD. And now you have a copy of the book of Isaiah from 200 BC. And they found that both of these were identical. That means... Over a period of 1,100 years, as these copies were hand copied by scribes, that's how, that's how they did it. The error in copying was almost negligible, no error. Identical copy from 200 BC to 900 AD, the book of Isaiah was unchanged. I'll tell you, when you study Shakespeare, you don't learn this in school, but there are 37 variations of Shakespeare's text. That means they don't know which one is the accurate text. 37 variations to Shakespeare. So you're studying one which could have been his original or maybe somebody else wrote something else on Shakespeare's name. But not so with the Bible. Not so with the Bible. And the other thing I want us to understand in terms of number of manuscripts, you know, we, Greek philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, around 300 BC, 
The time gap of their manuscripts which we have today is 1,300 years. The time gap of their manuscripts. And people think, oh, I'm quoting Aristotle, I'm quoting Plato. They don't know they're quoting something that is 1,300 years after what he said and they don't even know if it's accurate. The second thing is the number of manuscripts. We have, there are probably about 10 manuscripts of the works of these philosophers. For the, New, for the Old Testament, we have 10,000 manuscripts. For the New Testament, we have 24,000 manuscripts. And the New Testament time gap is only 50 years. If there is any ancient literature that is accurate and authentic, there is nothing more reliable than the Holy Scriptures. You can clap for that. Amen. So... People make us study ancient scripture and then they ask, challenge us to question the authenticity of the Bible. They don't know that this ancient literature they are studying is more questionable than the holy scriptures. Are you listening? Now to the message. <laughs> so here in Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah has several servant songs. That means Isaiah as a prophet speaks ahead of time about the servant or the Messiah. Servant songs they are called. And he's talking about the Messiah. He's, now this is 750 years before Christ. And he's talking about Christ. 750 years. And so we are just reading one of his many servant songs. One of his many prophecies concerning Christ and this particular passage we've read which starts in Isaiah 52 13 goes on all the way to Isaiah 53 verse 12 is his description of the cross of Christ by the Holy Spirit and we'll be amazed to see how Isaiah prophesying 750 years before Christ and what would take place on the cross is so accurate in his description of what would take place on the cross. One author put it this way, it is the cross in high definition. I mean, you can see the details. But he was speaking 750 years ahead of time. It could only have been by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen? And so now we want to just spend some time soaking in these verses, just enjoying what Isaiah says, uh, or has, has, has prophesied about the cross. But I want us to look at it in three views. One is what he tells us happened on the cross. So just let's understand what Isaiah says happened on the cross. But I also want you to look at it from, okay, the second view is this. If Jesus did it then on the cross, what does it mean to me? Because everything he did on the cross, he did it. For you and for me. Amen. So to say, okay, what, 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 what comes into my life because of the cross? And the third view is, how can I imitate the cross? Because that's another thing that the writers of the New Testament look back at the cross and say, because Christ was like this, you and I should live like this. The imitation of the cross. Are you with me? So let's look at it from these three perspectives. What actually happened? How does it affect me? And how should I imitate the cross? Amen? So Isaiah 52 verse 12, he begins by saying, Behold my servant. You know, I, I wish we had five hours like they normally have on Good Friday services. I don't know how many hours. I mean, really, we could spend five hours, seriously, in, in this passage. And I'm trying not to keep you that long. Isaiah 52 verse 12, uh, verse 13. Behold my servant. Behold my servant. And then, okay, let's read the whole verse. My servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. So he's talking about God's servant. And it, it's interesting to see those words. He says, uh, he uses the word in the Hebrew, which is actually bond servant of Adonai. Behold, the bond servant of Adonai. So the word there for servant really is the word bond servant. Now what is a bond servant, at least in the Old Testament context? 
You see, in, in, in among the people of Israel, suppose a man went into debt. He borrowed money from somebody and he was unable to pay back. He lost his money, he lost his property, whatever. He's in debt. He's unable to pay back. He had an option, and usually this is the option they took, where they would submit themselves to become a servant to the person they owed money and work for them for a period of six years. So you become a servant. You're forced into that position because you owe money. You can't repay. So you become a servant for six years. And on the seventh year, you are redeemed. You're allowed to go back. If you earned enough money to buy your land back, you can do that and so on. But now, there's another option. If you really, 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 really like your master, and after six years, you make a deliberate choice to continue as his servant, but for the rest of your life, then you go tell him, you've been such a good master to me, I want to be your servant for the rest of your life. And he will put a ring on your ear to mark you that you have now become his bond servant. You have made the choice to be his servant for the rest of your life and do whatever he says. That's a bond servant. Are you with me? So that's the word used for Jesus Christ. He was Adonai's bond servant. Somebody who came to offer his entire life to willingly do the will of his master. Behold my bond servant. And right here in this verse, Isaiah is, even before he talks about the cross, he talks about the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation of Christ. He says, behold my servant, he will deal prudently, he will deal, he will deal intelligently, he will deal wisely. He's going to do this in a very uh, intelligent, wise way. The cross is an expression of God's wisdom, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Behold, my servant will do wisely. Are you with me so far? Or is Good Friday not a good day to study the word or something? Okay. All right, stay with me. All right, so he says, Behold my servant, he's going to deal prudently. He's going to deal wisely. He's going to do this. And as a result, three things are going to happen to him. He will be exalted. The word in Hebrew simply means he'll be raised up. Talking about his resurrection. And extolled. To be lifted up, talking about his ascension, and be very high. Hebrew means raised up to high places, talking about his exaltation. Are you with me? Yes? No. So Isaiah is saying, behold my servant, he will deal prudently. He will be extolled. He will be exalted extolled and be very high. He's talking about the other side of the cross. This is what's going to happen. He's already foretelling about the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. His, just as many were astonished at you. So his visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men and that's exactly what happened to jesus when he was crucified on the cross just as many were astonished the word that means to grow numb they're going to look at this and they grow numb his appearance was so marred disfigured more than any man and his form his appearance more than the sons of man verse 15 Isaiah 52 so shall he sprinkle many nations. That is interesting. The word sprinkle is very interesting. It's from the Old Testament again. It had to do with the blood of the sin offering. That the high priest, so the priest would take that blood and he will sprinkle it, sprinkle it before the altar. He would sprinkle it on the people as a sign that sin had been paid for or atoned for. That's the word. He will sprinkle 
many nations. The word nations there actually means Gentiles. So Isaiah is saying that when Christ died on the cross, he died for everyone, including the Gentiles. Are you with me? So you and I can say India has been sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. So when we pray for India, we pray like that. India has been sprinkled. Devil, we want to announce to you, 2,000 years ago when Jesus cried on the, died on the cross, he sprinkled India with his blood. He shall sprinkle many nations, peoples, Gentiles. The blood has been shed, sprinkled. An offering has been made for the nations. And Kings will shut their mouths at him. For what has not been told them they shall see and what they have not heard they shall consider. That means leaders, rulers will stand in amazement at Jesus Christ. And we've had through history several great historical or, or even contemporary leaders. We can have quotes of them. You've probably heard some of them. But everyone says, this man Jesus, amazing, different. He never wrote a book. He never had an army. never built an institution. never formed a religion. never traveled more than 200 miles from his place of birth. And yet today the whole world talks about him. No Facebook, no WhatsApp, none of that. Kings stand amazed. At his influence on the nations. And what they have not heard. And what they never even thought would happen. They stand amazed on his influence over many nations. Chapter 53 verse 1. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Now Isaiah is saying look. I have something to say. But not many people can really believe it. Who has believed our reports? It is interesting that that same phrase, that, that same verse is quoted over in the New Testament twice. You'll read about it in John 12, where it, verses 37 and 38, where it says that after, it says here, I'm quoting from John 12, 37 and 38. But although he did so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke. Lord who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. So even though he did miracles and he came with, with, with the demonstrations of power. People still didn't, didn't embrace him. Or Paul quotes it again in Romans 10 verse 16 in the context of the gospel. He says they have, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Romans 10 verse 16. For Isaiah says Lord who has believed our reports. So the report here. Is the gospel itself. Who has believed our report? What Isaiah is going to speak about. The message of the cross. Who has believed our report? But Isaiah makes something. Makes a very important statement here. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He says this report. That I am going to bring to you. Is actually going to reveal the power. The arm of God means the power of God. This report is going to reveal the arm of God, the power of God. And so in the New Testament, we have Paul saying the gospel is the power of God. In 1 Corinthians 1, he writes, he says, the message of the cross, it is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So this report about the cross, it actually is a revelation of the arm of the Lord. Are you with me? Yes or no? All right. I, I keep asking. I just want to make sure you don't sleep. <laughs> Who has believed the reports? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 2. For he, the servant, will grow up before him as a tender plant. That is, he'll grow up before God as a tender plant. Talking about how Jesus would grow up under the watchful eye, the protective eye of God. He will grow up before him as a tender 
plan. The Lord watching over his life as he grows up. And as a root out of dry ground, he's coming out, coming up in difficult times. His life was threatened. A root out of dry ground. That's his life as he's going to grow up. He has no form or comeliness or magnificence. And then we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, he's not coming with some great pomp and grandeur as a king. There is nothing attractive about him. Is what Isaiah says. In fact, the Bible says in John, he came to his own, but his own did not receive. So people are not necessarily attracted by his coming. So that really perplexed the people of Israel. Because they were looking for a Messiah who would come with great power and great show. And here comes somebody who has grown up like a tender plant, like a root of dry ground. And, and he has nothing attractive in his personage, in who he is as a person. He's a carpenter. He wasn't born in a palace. No a great education. Nothing that would attract people. God chose to do that. But you know, there's an important message for, in that for you and me. You and I are, are familiar with the passage I quoted earlier from Philippians. That though he was God, he became like a servant. And he became obedient to death. I mean, he could have come like God. Lights flashing through his body. A big glow around him. Twelve angels on the right and twelve angels on the left. Say, hello, I am the savior of the world. <laughs> bow, everyone bow. I mean, he could have come like that if he wanted to. But the Bible says he made himself of no reputation. And humbled himself. And so the writer Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. So this is the third perspective. How does the cross affect me? Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ. Jesus. Amen. I want to challenge you to practice that. You see, most of us, even though we are believers, even though we are Christians and we say we are Christ-like, you know, the real test is when you are made of no reputation, how do you react? Amen? Be Christ-like. Can you really walk it? Can you live it? Second Corinthians 8 and verse 9 says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich... Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Though he was rich, he became poor. Though you're a leader, can you be a servant? So that others through your serving could be enriched? Amen? That's Christ's likeness. Be willing to serve without a role, a title, a name. Make yourself of no reputation. That's being Christ-like. Doesn't matter how high you are, who you are. Don't live to preserve your reputation. You don't have a reputation. You're dead. A dead man has no business cards. Amen. He has no reputation to maintain. Amen. Uh, we can spend a lot of time on it. Let's move on. <laughs> so, verse 2. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness when we see him. There is no beauty that we should desire in verse 3. He is despised. That means he's scorned, he's treated with contempt, he's treated like a wild person. And rejected, he's abandoned, left aside by men. That's exactly what happens. 
He was rejected by the high priests, the chief priests, by the leaders. And he was even abandoned by his own disciples. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. The easy to read version for us non-theologians makes it simple to understand. It says, we treated him like someone of no importance, like someone people will not even look at, but turn away from in disgust. That's how people treated him. But right here in verse 3, I want you to see what Isaiah starts to bring out. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The literal Hebrew for sorrows is the word pains. Markob, pains. He's a man full of pain. And acquainted with grief. The word literally there means sickness. So I want to ask, I want you to think this, think this through. Was Jesus in pain and sickness throughout his earthly life? Or was Jesus in pain and sickness on the cross? On the cross. So when it says he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, when he was a man full of pain and sickness, it's not referring to his earthly life. It's referring to that time on the cross. He became somebody full of pain, full of sickness. That's what he says. Did he do it? Did he do that for you and me? That means Isaiah, even before presenting Christ as the sin bearer, he first presents Christ as the sickness bearer. Are you with me? Even before he presents Christ as a sin bearer, he's saying he was a man full of pain and sickness. Next verse. Verse 4, surely, that means this is without question, without a doubt. Certainly, he has borne to lift up, to rise up, carry away, and cast away. Let's say this together. Lift up, carry up, and cast away. To lift up, carry away. And cast away. One more time. To lift up. Carry away. And cast away. Surely. He has borne. Our. Griefs. And carried. Our. Sorrows. He's repeating what he said in verse 3. He is a man of sorrows. Acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs, sicknesses, and carried our sorrows, pains. Are you with me? Now, the best way to interpret scripture is to let scripture interpret scripture. So when you go to Matthew, the 8th chapter, the 17th verse, verse 16 and 17, here's you, what you'll find now, the gospel, Matthew, gospel writer of Matthew, Matthew, he's writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And here's how he interprets Isaiah 53 verse 4. Let me read Matthew 8 verse 16 and 17. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. He cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet saying... He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So what is he talking about? He's talking about literal sickness and disease. Are you with me? 
You see, theologians argue, is divine healing in the atonement or not? Did Jesus bear our sickness and disease or not? Whose interpretation should we trust? Some theologians or the scripture's interpretation of itself? Let scripture interpret scripture. How does Matthew 8, 16 and 17 interpret Isaiah 53 verse 4? It is not talking about some spiritual thing. It's talking about demon possession. It's talking about people who had sicknesses and diseases and ailments in their bodies. They brought those who were demon possessed. They brought those who were sick and... Sorry. It's a wire running here. They brought those who were sick and, and troubled and they brought them to Jesus. And Jesus cast out the spirits with a word. And he healed all who were sick in order to fulfill what Isaiah prophesied. Surely he has borne our sicknesses. And carried our pains. In no way could this refer to something just spiritual pain. You know, this is literal physical sickness he's talking about. Let scripture interpret scripture and every theologian be a liar. Amen. The scripture is telling us this is what happened. He bore our sickness. He carried our pains. Now... Remember that people were forgiven before the cross and people were healed before the cross. Jesus told the man in the stretcher, son, your sins are forgiven you. But he was doing it before the cross. How could he do that? He was doing it as a foretaste or as a down payment, a payment in advance. Because he was going to take care of their sins on the cross. So how was he healing all these people? Because he was going to become a man of sorrows acquainted with grief for them. Because he was surely going to carry their sicknesses and pains on the cross. So here he was saying, I'll give it to you in advance. Take. Because I will take care of this on the cross. How much more you and I on the other side of the cross can look back and say, it has finished. He has carried. He has lifted Carried away and cast away my sickness and my pains. It is done. It's done 2,000 years ago. If people in Bible times could receive it in advance, how much more you and I can receive it because it has actually been completed. Surely he has borne our griefs, our sicknesses, and carried our pains. Yet, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. That means we thought God was punishing him for some wrong thing he had done. Verse 5. But he says, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Now he's bringing the idea of sin. Two verses, he's talked about sickness and disease and pain. Now he's talking about Jesus becoming our sin bearer. But he was wounded for our transgressions, our sins, our rebellion, our wrongdoing. He was bruised, he was beaten upon, he was crushed for our iniquities, our perversity, our evil, our fault, our guilt. Now this is a little different, just, I mean, this is, I don't want to get hard and fast on this, but just to help us understand, he's talking about two things, transgressions and iniquity. Transgression has to do with the deeds. Iniquity has to do with our propensity for those deeds. Transgression has to do with our actions. Iniquity has to deal, also deal with the guilt that results from those actions. Are you understanding the two differences? But he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquity. He took care of both. He took care of both. The deed and the propensity towards the deed and the guilt that results from the deed. He took care of the whole thing to set us free from it. Surely. But he was, sorry, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Which means you and I are set free 
from our propensity towards sin, from the actions, from the consequences of those actions, and the guilt as well. Are you with me? He did it for you and me. He was wounded for our transgressions, was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement or punishment for our peace, shalom, was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. See, this verse is so rich. Telling us what we receive. This is the second perspective, second view. Of what we receive because of the cross. Our transgressions are taken care of. Our iniquities are taken care of. And then he says, the punishment to bring us peace, shalom. The word shalom simply means total wholeness. It has to do with well-being of spirit, of soul, of body, socially, economically, financially. I mean, just everything. That is shalom. Are you understanding? We don't have a single English word like shalom. So we use shalom. Because in order to describe shalom, you would need words like peace plus tranquility plus uh, good relationships plus emotional wholeness plus financial well-being plus every. I mean, it's like your whole life is in order. That is shalom. The punishment to bring us shalom was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. That word healed is Rapha. Same word that we know God as Jehovah. So this word says our sins are been dealt with. The guilt and the shame and the propensity towards sin has been dealt with. Wholeness has been brought into our lives. And healing, physical healing has been brought into our lives through the cross. Are you with me? I know some of you are saying, Pastor, please go fast. <laughs> You're only at verse 5. <laughs> There's seven more to go. I'm just joking. <laughs> He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement to bring us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are. That word Rapha is an interesting word. Because when God revealed himself of Jehovah Rapha, this is in Exodus 15, 23 to 25. 26, Exodus 15. The, the, the people of Israel, they'd come to a place where they hadn't had water for three days. And they'd come to a place where there was water, but the waters were bitter. They couldn't drink it. And so God told Moses, Moses, you see a tree there? Take the tree and throw it into the water. And the water becomes feet, sweet. And God says, I am the Lord who heals you. That tree is a type of Jesus. Jesus is the tree that makes our bitter into sweets. That's Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who turns our bitter into sweets. The Lord who turns our sickness into wholeness. Jehovah Rapha. By his stripes we are healed. Now one more thing. Let scripture Interpret scripture. So Isaiah, looking ahead to the cross, 750 years ahead, looking into the future, says, by his stripes we are healed. Peter, looking back at the cross, which should be your perspective and mine, in 1 Peter 2.24 says, by his stripes we are were healed. So say this with me. By the wounds of Jesus, I was healed. I have been healed. 
My body is a healed body. Amen? Wholeness is in my life. Okay, say it if you believe it. Say it like you believe it. Sins and my sin and my iniquity has been removed. It's been done, right? It's been done. So he says, when you look back, it is a past tense reality. Isaiah is looking ahead. You will be healed. You and I look back and say, we were healed. Let scripture interpret scripture. That's your perspective and mine of the cross. Okay, I need to move fast. Otherwise, I'll be preaching to empty chairs. <laughs> Isaiah 53, verse 6. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So say, look, we've the, we're the ones who've gone astray. All of us, we've, we've wandered away from God. But the Lord has laid. Again, that Hebrew word is very interesting, paga. It has two meanings to it. One is to, literally, to put upon, to lay upon, like we saw the word bear. Here is to just dump on somebody. The Lord God has dumped on him all our sins. But that word paga is also used as an intercessory word. It also means to meet together. When I meet with you, to entreat favor on behalf of another. So the Lord dumped all our sins on him so that he can become our intercessor. The one who intercedes before God for our sins. Are you with me? All we like sheep have gone astray. But God took all our sins, put it on him so that he becomes now our intercessor before God. So that our sins can be Forgiven. He meets together with God on our behalf for the, our sins so that our sins can be removed. And in the New Testament, Paul writes, he says, Him who knew no sin, he, he made to be sin for us that we should become the righteousness of God. Isaiah 53 verse 7, I'll move quickly. He was oppressed. Literally means he was driven as an animal, harassed, distressed, painfully abused. And he was afflicted. He was dealt hard. He was looked down upon. He was forced down. He was treated badly. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was, he led, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Now we know this is exactly what happened in all the events that preceded the cross. From the night of his betrayal. And his apprehension and him spending the night in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the palace held as a prisoner. And all that the soldiers did to him. He was abused. He was crushed. He was treated very badly. And the Bible says he opened not his. Now, this is a very challenging thing. But we've got to face up to it. The Apostle Peter quotes this for you and me as New Testament believers. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter looks back at this and he says, and I'm reading verse 17 to 25. He says, believers, let's imitate the cross. Are you with me? And this is what he says. 1 Peter 2, 17 25. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king, servants. Be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your falls, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For, this, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. 
who when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. What is Peter saying? He's saying, you see Jesus, how he was treated? And then he was treated so badly, he never retaliated. And then he's saying, you and I, in the context of our everyday lives, let's be like this. It says, you servants, meaning in your workplace. He's really talking about the workplace. It's in your workplace. If you've got a bad boss who mistreats you, he says, be like Jesus. Are you listening? Be like him. When he was reviled, he did not retaliate. He did not open his mouth. He just, he committed everything to the Lord. He says, now let's, let us be like that. Amen? So the cross has its practical application even in our workplace, in our everyday lives. So let's say, for example, you know, you were, you were a team leader in your project team or you were a manager and your boss over you suddenly decides that somebody else is going to be a team leader or you are due for a promotion but your boss overlooks you and gives a promotion to somebody else on your team what should your response be submit your resignation leave the team he overlooked me what does Peter say what does Peter say? Be like Jesus. That even when he was dealt unjustly, unfairly, he did not open his mouth. He didn't open his mouth. But Peter says that you do what is commendable before God. And commit yourself to the one who judges righteously. Are you with me? A few of you. <laughs> but look, this is the imitation of the cross in our everyday life. Saying, do what Jesus did. Practical. In your workplace. Or it could happen in some other scenario. It could happen in your home. It could happen on the football field. You become part of the church basketball team. Sohas takes you out to play basketball. <laughs> I don't know. And then they say, okay, uh, you don't play. Let somebody else play. Oh, these Christians. <laughs> hey, relax. Imitate Jesus right there at that moment on the basketball field. Amen. That's what Peter is saying. It applies to our everyday life. That if you feel you've been abused, if you feel you've been treated badly, commit yourself to the one who judges righteously. Amen. Now, I'm not saying you stay there and get, you know, beaten and all that. You can move yourself to a safe place. But we're talking about not retaliating, not opening your mouth to defend yourself. You commit that to the Lord. Okay. Verse 8. The plane is getting ready to land. <laughs> he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. I want you to see the the detail, the precision of his prophecy. He was taken from prison. One night, Jesus was held a prisoner in the palace. He was captured that night. He had to wait for his trial before Pilate the next morning. He was a prisoner. He was taken from prison. Next morning was judgment. He stood before Pilate. And Pilate asked him all, all kinds of questions. He was taken from prison and from judgment. 
Are you seeing the detail of that prophecy? And then he was cut off, that he was killed from the land of the living. But this also happened for the transgressions of my people, for the sins of my people. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked. When he died, he died between two criminals. Are you understanding? Again, the detail. He made his grave with the wicked. He was killed like another criminal. But there's a sudden twist. But with the rich at his death. Whoa. He was buried like a rich man. Because he had a rich, there was a rich man named Joseph of Armitia. Who believed in Jesus. He went to Pilate. I mean, he had access to Pilate. He was a rich man. He was a man of influence. He personally went to Pilate and said, Pilate, I want that dead man's body. And he took Jesus' body and buried it in his own personal tomb. A tomb that he had purchased for himself in the garden. So he was crucified with criminals. He was buried with the rich. Detailed prophecy being fulfilled of specific events of his crucifixion. Are you listening? The made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, found in his mouth. Pilate said, I don't find anything wrong with this man. I can't find anything wrong with this man. I washed my hands. There was no deceit in his mouth. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to crush him. That means it was the desire of God. Please, means it was God's desire for him to go through this. He has put him to grief that God allowed him to carry the sickness here. When you make his soul an offering for sin. That's interesting One more, t once again. Offering for sin is actually one word. Sin offering. Or a trespass offering. And you and I, we know from the Old Testament, that was the offering they brought when somebody sinned. They brought that offering so that their sins could be covered. Their sins could be forgiven. He made himself, he made his soul an offering for sin. So Jesus became our sin offering. And then what happened? When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He will see his descendants. He will prolong his days. He's going to live beyond that. And the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand, meaning the purpose for which he came will be fulfilled. So it's very interesting. He's saying Jesus is going to make himself an offering for sin. He's going to be a sin offering. But there's something happening. Out of that sin offering comes his seed. His children. He will see his children. He will prolong his day. He's going to live beyond that. So what's it talking about? His? You can take a guess. His resurrection. He will prolong his? Meaning his life doesn't end when he makes his, himself an offering for sin. Out of that offering comes his descendants. People are going to rise. Born again. He was the first begotten of the dead. You and I are also begotten. When we are born again. He out of his offering. He will see his descendants. 
He will prolong his days. And God's purpose will be fulfilled. He said, it is finished. It is finished. Are you seeing the details of Isaiah's prophecy? It's amazing. That out of that offering will come children. You and I will be born or born again. Because he made his soul an offering for sin. But it, his life will not end there. He will prolong his days. He's going to live forever. And God's purpose will be fulfilled. Verse 11. He will see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. That is the servant. The Lord Jesus himself. And I, I'm just trying to summarize what I've read. I studied from other versions. When, when, when one version is not clear, what I do is I look up other versions so I can get it clear. There can be clarity. So I'm just giving you the essence of that. He that is a servant himself is satisfied with what he paid, the travail of his soul. He will see, he himself will be satisfied with the travail of his soul. And by his knowledge, by his wisdom, he will justify many. And this is powerful because Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, you know, if the rulers of this world had known the wisdom of God, they would not have crucified Jesus. If they had known what was going to happen because of the cross, they would not have done it. But by his wisdom, he did it so that he could justify many. He could declare you and me free from guilt and bring us into that place of right standing with God. For he will bear their iniquities. And last one. Just wake your neighbor up, please. So they are about to land. Verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. Now God is speaking. I am going to celebrate him. I'm going to declare him the champion, the hero, the winner, the triumphant one, the victor. He will divide his portion with the great. The easy to read version says, For this reason, I will treat him as one of my great people. I will give him the rewards of one who wins in battle. That means he, he becomes the triumphant one. He becomes the champion. I will divide him a portion with the great. Jesus is the victor. Amen? And then he says, and he will divide the spoil with the strong. Now you and I come into the picture here. So really wake your neighbor up. It says he will divide the spoil with the strong. I'll just read it to you from the easy to read version. It's, it's really nice here. It says, and he will sh uh, uh, I will give him the rewards of one who wins in battle and he will share them with his powerful ones. Amen. He's going to be somebody who's won in battle. He's got the reward. But he's going to share it with you and me. And you and I are called the powerful ones. We didn't fight. He fought. But we're enjoying his rewards. Amen. We're enjoying what he finished on the cross. On the cross he triumphed over every demonic power. He conquered them. Colossians 2.14 and 15 says. And Hebrews 2.14 says he, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. He said look that triumph is going to be shared among his people. You and me. Amen? Now listen, you and I need to really believe this. There is no reason why you as a believer should be afraid of evil spirits. You can say an amen. There is no reason why you as a believer should be afraid of anything the devil wants to do against you. Just laugh. Just laugh. Devil. You think you're, you're going to do something against me. I am sharing. You are sharing in Christ's victory. 
The Bible says the God of peace will crush Satan underneath your feet. Amen. There is absolutely no reason why you as a believer should even fear or have the slightest fear of the enemy. As far as you as a believer is concerned, the devil is already defeated. So now people come and give strange prophecies. The devil is going to strangle you. The devil is going to trip you. Come on, relax. Don't you know the word of God? Don't you know the cross of Jesus? Don't you know the Bible says the devil is underneath our feet? What is all this? As a believer, there is no need for you to have any fear of what the devil can do, what the enemy can try. Just stay with the word of God. Amen. So don't let any of these things trouble you. What does the Bible say? He has made his por portion with a great. He's, one of the, he's the winner. He's a champion. And his triumph he has distributed to his people. You and I stand in his victory. Amen. When you minister to people who need healing, who need deliverance, you minister on the basis of the cross. On basis of this victory, devil, you have to listen to me. Amen? You have to listen to me. Because you come on the basis of Christ's triumph on the cross. He has divided his spoil with the strong and evil bear. Because he has poured out his soul under death and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession. For the transgressors. As he did it for you and me. We are the ones who did all the wrong things. But he made intercession for you and me. Let me just close with this verse. I mean the, the, these last few. Verses here are really powerful. He made intercession for us. Paga. He became our sin bearer. Our burden bearer. And our intercessor. The beautiful thing in the New Testament. You come to Hebrews. In Hebrews 7.25. The writer of Hebrews looks back and he says. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He is able to save us to the uttermost. Because he is still making intercession for us. Amen. He did it once on the cross. And he's still doing it. So today if you and I stumble and fall, you know. It's not the end of the world. We just say, thank God he did it for me on the cross. And my sins were dealt with. And there is Jesus in heaven still making intercession for you and me. He ever lives to make intercession for you and me. Amen. He's our intercessor. So let there be no shame, no guilt, no condemnation against any of us. Amen. So. We looked at what Isaiah said about the cross. So that's one view. Second view. What is yours because of the cross? Your sins are forgiven. The propensity and the guilt of sin is removed. He has removed your sickness and disease. Shalom is yours. Triumph over the devil. The adversary of your soul is yours because of the cross. That's yours. But there's one more view. I've got to imitate the cross. He made himself of no reputation. So let that same mind be in you. When he was abused, he did not retaliate. But he committed his judgment to God. That's another aspect of the cross. It's imitate Christ. Amen. When we look at the finished work, of, when we look at the cross, you look at it as a finished work. Your sins are forgiven. You've been healed. Could we all rise to our feet, please? I just want to pray over us. And then we will get ready to close. I'll... Father, we thank you for the cross. God, it amazes us, God, how you worked through time and how Isaiah foretold the cross with such detail. 
And we thank you, Jesus, that you came. You finished the work for us. And right here in this place, let your power and your glory be manifested, God. In that name, in the power of that name, and in the power of the cross, in the power of that shed blood of Jesus, which causes Satan and all his demons to tremble, in the power and the authority of that finished work, I command sicknesses and diseases to be broken off of people's bodies. Chronic illnesses to leave. I command wholeness to come into the minds and the bodies of God's people. I command the shalom of God into our lives and our families and our relationships and our finances. And we say we are the redeemed of the Lord. And the devil has no place, no right over our lives. In the name of Jesus. So right now, right now. I break off every oppression of the enemy. I break off every evil work over our lives, our families, our homes, our finances. I declare the power of the cross. I declare shalom for each of us. For each of us. For each of us. For each of us. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We bless you. We bless you. Thank you for your healing power, God, being released in people's bodies right now. Thank you, God, for right now healing. God, your healing power just being released right now. I want you to go ahead and receive your healing by faith right now. Just say, Father, I receive. I receive. I declare backs to be made whole right now. Problems in the back, back conditions. I command healing to that. I command healing to arthritis and arthritic conditions. I command that to be completely broken off of people's bodies. All ailments, sicknesses. I don't have to mention by name, but you receive. You receive by faith right now. God, we thank you. Thank you, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also visit our website apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.